Old Yeller, Chapter 10. With hogs ranging in the woods like that, it was hard to know for certain when you'd found them all. But I kept a piece of ear from every pig I marked. I carried the pieces home in my pockets and I stuck them on a sharp pointed stick which I kept hanging in the corn crib. When the count reached 46, and I couldn't seem to locate any new bunches of hogs, Mom and I decided that that was all the pigs the sows had raised that year. So I had left off hog hunting and started getting ready to gather corn when Bud Searcy paid us another visit. He told me about one bunch of hogs I'd missed. They're clear back in that bat cave country, the yonder side of Salt Bridge, he said. Russell Sim Simpson ran into them a couple days ago feeding on pear apples and then prickly pear flats. Said there was five pigs following three sows bearing your mark, a couple old bar hogs ranging with them. I'd never been that far the other side of the salt branch before, but Papa told me about the back cave. I figured I could find the place. So early the next morning, I set out with Old Yeller, glad for the chance to hunt hogs a while longer before starting in on the corn gathering. Also, if I was lucky and found the hogs early, maybe I'd have time to visit the cave and watch the bats come out. Papa had told me that was a real sight, the way the bats come out in the late afternoon. I was sure anxious to go see it. I always like to go see the far places and strange sights. Like one place on Salt Branch that I'd found, there was a high undercut cliff there and some birds building their nest against the face of it. There were little gray sharp winged swallows and they gathered sticky mud out of the hog wallow and carried it up and stuck it to the bare rocks of the cliff, shaping the mud into little bulging nests with a single hole in the center of each one. The young birds hatched out there and stuck their heads through the holes to get at the worms and bugs the grown birds brought to them. The mud nests were so thick on the face of that cliff that, from a distance, the wall looked like it was covered with honeycomb. There was another place I liked too. It was a wild, lonesome place, down deep in a canyon that was bent in the shape of a horseshoe. Tall trees grew down in the canyon and leaned out over a deep hole of clear water. In the trees nested hundreds of long-shanked herons, blue ones and white ones with black wing tips. The herons built huge ragged nests of sticks and trash and sat around in the trees all day long, fussing and staining the tree branches with their white droppings. And beneath them, down in the clear water, yard-long catfish lay on the sandy bottom, waiting to gobble up any young birds that happened to fall out of the nest. The back cave seemed like another one of those wild places I liked to see. I sure hoped I could locate the hogs in time to pay it a visit while I was close by. We located the hogs in plenty of time, but before we were done with them, I didn't want to go see a bat cave or anything else. Old Yeller struck the hogs trail at the water hole. He ran the scent out into the regular forest to prickly pear. Bright red apples fringed the edge of the pear pads. In places where the hogs had fed, bits of peel and black seeds and red juice stain lay on the ground. The sight made me wonder again how a hog could be tough enough to eat prickly pear apples with their millions of little hair-like spines. I ate them myself sometimes, for pear apples are good eating. But even after I'd polished them clean by rubbing them in the sand, I generally wound up with several stickers in my mouth. But the hogs didn't seem to mind the stickers. Neither did the wild turkeys or the pack rats or the little big-eared ring-tail cats. All of those creatures came to the pear flats when the apples started turning red. Old Yeller's yelling bay told me that he'd caught up with the hogs. I heard their rumbling roars and ran through the pair of clumps toward the sound. They were the hogs that Russell Simpson had sent word about. There were five pigs, three sows, and a couple of bar hogs, all but the pigs wearing our mark. Their faces bristled with long pear spines that they'd got stuck out with, reaching for apples. Red juice stain was smeared all over their snouts. They stood backed up against a big prickly pear clump. Their anger had their bristles staining and high fierce ridges along their backbones. They roared and popped their teeth and dared me or Old Yeller to try and catch one of the squealing pigs. I looked around for the closest tree. It stood better than a quarter of a mile off. It was going to be rough on Old Yeller trying to lead them to it. Having to duck and dodge around those prickly pear, he was bound to come out bristling with more pear spines than the hogs had in their faces. But I couldn't see any other place to take them. I stuck off toward the tree, hollering at Old Yeller to bring them along. A deep cut bank draw ran through the pear flats between me and the huge mesquite tree I was heading for and it was down in the bottom of this draw that the hogs bulked. They found a place where the floodwaters had undercut one of the dirt banks to form a shallow cave. They backed up under the bank with the pigs behind them. 
No amount of barking and pestering by Old Yeller could get them out. Now and then, one of the old bar hogs would break ranks to make a quick cutting lunge at the dog, but when Yeller leaped away, the hog wouldn't follow up. He'd go right back to fill the gap he'd left in the half circle his mates had formed at the front of the cave. The hogs knew they'd found a natural spot for making a fight and stand, and they didn't aim to leave it. I went back and stood on the bank above them, looking down, wondering what to do. Then it came to me that all I needed to do was go to work. This dirt bank would serve me as well as a tree. There were the hogs right under me. They couldn't get to me from down there, not without having to go first maybe 50 yards down the draw to find a place to get out. An old yeller wouldn't let them do that. It wouldn't be easy to reach beneath that undercut bank and rope a pig, but I believed it could be done. I took my rope from around my waist and shook out a loop. I moved to the lip of the cut bank. The pigs were too far back under me for a good throw. Maybe if I lay down on my stomach, I could reach them. I did, and I reached back under and picked up the first pig, slick as a whistle. I drew him up and worked him over. I dropped him back and watched the old hog sniff his bloody wounds. The scent of his blood made them madder, and they roared louder. I lay there and waited. A second pig moved out from the back part of the cave that I couldn't quite see. He still wasn't quite far enough out. I inched forward and leaned further down to where I could see better. I could reach him with my loop now. I made my cast, and that's when it happened. The dirt bank broke beneath my weight. A wagon load of sand caved down and spilled over the angry hogs. I went with the sand. I guess I screamed. I don't know. It happened too fast. All I can really remember is the wild, heart-stopping scare I knew as I tumbled head over heels down among those killer hogs. The crumbling sand all but buried the hogs. I guess that's what saved me right at the start. I remember bumping into the back of one old bar hog, then leaping to my feet in a smothering fog of dry dust. I jumped blindly to one side as far as I could. I broke to run, but I was too late. A slashing touch caught me in the calf of my right leg. A searing pain shot up into my body. I screamed. I stumbled and went down. I screamed louder then, knowing that I could never get to my feet in time to escape the rush of angry hogs roaring down upon me. It was old Yeller who saved me, just like he'd saved little Arliss from the she-bear. He came in roaring with rage. He flung himself between me and the killer hogs. Fangs bared, he met them head on, slashing and snarling. He yelled with pain as the savage touches ripped into him. He took the awful punishment meant for me, but held his ground. He gave me that one in a hundred chance to get free. I took it. I leaped to my feet. In wild terror, I ran along the bed of that dry wash, cut right up a sloping bank, and then I took out through the forest a prickly pear. I ran till a forked stick tripped me, and I fell. It seemed like that fall, or maybe it was the long prickly pear spines that stabbed me in the hip, brought me out of my scare. I sat up, still panting for breath and with the blood hammering in my ears, but I was all right in my mind again. I yanked the spines out of my hip and then pulled up my slashed pants to look at my leg. Sight of so much blood nearly threw me into another panic. It was streaming out of the cut and clear down into my shoe. I sat and stared at it for a minute and then shivered. Then I got a hold of myself again. I wiped away the blood. The gash was a bad one, clear to the bone, I could tell, and plenty long. But it didn't hurt much, not yet, that is. The main hurt would start later, I guess, after the bleeding stopped and the legs started to get stiff. I guess I better hurry and tie up the place and get home as quick as I could. Once that leg started getting stiff, I might not make it. I took my knife and cut a strip off the tail of my sh shirt. I bound my leg as tight as I could. I got up to see if I could walk with the leg wrapped as tight as I had it, and I could. But when I set out, it wasn't in the direction of home. It was back along the trail through the prickly pear. I don't know what made me do it. I didn't think to myself, Old Yeller saved my life and I can't go off and leave him. He's bound to be dead and it would sure look shabby to go home without finding out for sure. I have to go back even if my hurt leg gives out on me before I can get home. I didn't think anything like that. I just started walking in that direction and I kept walking till I found him. He lay in the dry wash about where I'd left to go running through the prickly pear. He'd try to follow me but was too hurt to keep going. He was holed up under a broad slab of red sandstone rock that had slipped off a high bank and now lay propped up against a round boulder in such a way as to form a sort of cave. He'd taken refuge there from the hogs. The hogs were gone now. 
but I could see their tracks in the sand around the rocks where they tried to get at him from, a, from behind. I'd have missed him hidden there under that rock slab if he hadn't whined as I walked past. I knelt beside him and coaxed him out from under the rocks. He grunted and groaned as he dragged himself toward me. He sank back to the ground, his blood spear smeared body trembling while he wiggled his stub tail and tried to lick my hog cut leg. A big lump came up in my throat. Tears stung my eyes, blinding me. Here he was, trying to lick my wound when he was bleeding from a dozen worse ones. And worst of all was his belly. It was ripped wide open and some of his insides were bulging out through the slit. It was a horrible sight. It was so horrible that for a second I didn't look at it. I wanted to run off. I didn't want to stay and look at something that filled me with such a numb and terror. But I didn't run off. I shut my eyes and made myself run a hand over old Yeller's head. The stickiness of the blood on it made my flesh crawl, but I made myself do it. Maybe I couldn't do him any good, but I wasn't going to go run off and leave him to die all by himself. Then it came to me that he wasn't dead yet. Maybe he didn't have to die. Maybe there was something I could do to save him. Maybe if I hurried home, I could get Mama to come back and help me. Mama'd know what to do. Mama always knew what to do when somebody got hurt. I wiped the tears from my eyes with my shirt sleeves and made myself think what to do. I took off my shirt and tore it into strips. I used a sleeve to wipe the sand away from the belly wound. Carefully, I eased his entrails back into place. Then I pulled the lips of the wound together and wound strips of my shirt around Yeller's body. I wound them tight and tied the strips together so they couldn't work loose. All the time I worked on him, old Yeller didn't let out a whimper. But when I shoved him back under the rock where he'd be out of the hot sun, he started whining. I guess he knew that I was fixing to leave him, and he wanted to go too. He started crawling back out of his hole. I stood and studied for a while. I needed something to stop up that opening so that Yeller couldn't get out. It would have to be something too big and heavy for him to shove aside. I thought of a rock and went looking for one. What I found was even better. It was an uprooted dead mesquite tree lying on the bank of the wash. The stump end of the dead mesquite was big and heavy. It was almost too much for me to drag in the loose sand. I heaved and sweated and started my leg to bleed again. But I managed to get that tree stump where I wanted it. I slid an old yeller back under the rock slab. I scolded him and made him stay there till I could haul the tree stump into place. Like I figured, the stump just about filled the opening. Maybe a strong dog could have squeezed through the narrow opening that was left, but I didn't figure old Yeller could. I figured he'd be safe in there till I could get back. Yeller lay back under the rock slab now, staring at me with a look in his eyes that made that choking lump come into my throat again. It was a begging look, and old Yeller wasn't the kind of beg. I reached in and let him lick my hand. Yeller, I said, I'll be back. I'm promising that I'll be back. And then I lit out for home in a limping run. His howl followed me. It was the most mournful howl I ever heard.